And hey, good afternoon, everybody. How in the heck are you? Welcome back. Good to see everyone again. Sorry about the abrupt end to last night's stream. Kyle's internet died, and after that, we were just... You know, there, there were things that I was in the middle of discussing with him, and it it, it just kind of killed it. But I think we'd pretty much gone over everything that we had wanted to go over. Hello, Katie, Adam, Cam, Chris, all over on the YouTubes. And two silent viewers. Ooh, mysterious. Don't have anybody over on Facebook yet, but that's okay. They'll come. Damien, Bo, good to see you. So I had said, I had uh, said at the end of the last stream where we were learning about D&D that we were just going to jump straight into combat. We, we were just, because the whole thing kind of jumps around, but I feel like it would be a disservice to go there immediately without touching on some of the things that apply directly to um characters and character creation from a DMing standpoint. Hey James. Um because you know I, I've talked I've talked about how DMing is an art and it really truly is. And it is an art that becomes more um, honed the more you practice, just like with any art. But if you've ever studied the masters, you know that art and science and so on are inseparable. So there is a bit of science to this. So why don't we go ahead and jump straight in, and I'll um, I'll crack open. The Dungeon Master's Guide real quick here. And you can follow along. I'll tell you the pages that we're on. Let's see. There's our preface. Again, we are never talking about this. This bell curve nonsense, that's... Yeah. It's nice to understand how and why dice function the way they do from an academic standpoint from a gameplay standpoint you need nothing of this so don't ever ask if if we're gonna if we're gonna go over there um one thing i want to touch on is i mentioned dragon magazine and so on yesterday uh creating the player character generation of ability scores there are many methods outlined in the dungeon master's guide and i've talked before about um about these different methods and uh you know 4d6 drop lowest arrange to taste but there's more than just those methods available so let's this is something that i feel like could have been in the player's handbook but i also understand that you as a dungeon master might preferentially enjoy one way over the other and so we'll take a look at the methods. Now, we're not going to go through uh, creating a character with each method, but rather take a look at this. Now, I vehemently disagree with Kyle that 3D6 down the line is the best way, and it's the only way, and Gary was soft, and so on, and etc. Um, that almost completely shuts out anything except thieves or fighters it, it 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 really really does sorry kyle it just does and while playing a lankmar type game can be fun um it might leave someone who wants to play a paladin out in the cold so we have a little bit more flexibility from a creation standpoint if we look 
at these different methods that you can offer your players. And I need to zoom into this a little bit. Let's see. Let's take this up to 100. There we go. That's good. All right. Maybe a little more. Let's let's do 125. Perfect. I think that's going to be perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, method one is the tried and true roll 4d6, discard lowest, arrange to taste. Now, you may produce some duds. You may not wind up with a character with a single stat over 11 doing 4d6, arrange to taste. That's just the dice. But odds are you can get the stats to do something like a monk or a paladin or, you know, have the ability scores to dual class if you're a human or run a bard or what have you. And Chris makes a good point. When you're just introducing people, 3d6 down the line can be, can be a good way to kind of get them into it just to so they understand um now another method you can try is method two all scores are recorded and arranged as in method one three d6 are rolled 12 times and the highest six scores are re retained so you basically make a matrix that is 12 by six and out of the 12 on your x-axis, you would have the characters pick which stats best suit them. Which this does, I, I said we weren't going to get into the bell curve a little bit, but I will mention it here. Um, this doesn't really break 3d6 down the line. It, 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 re, it really and truly doesn't. If you know how dice work, and if you've, on your own time, read the bell curve section, you know that things will tend to bunch around 9, 10, 11. And I think I just screwed that up. I, did, I, I just screwed that up. So method two is not... A grid method, it's not a matrix method. Method two is um Well no, no, I think that's right. Um Method oh okay, I was getting confused by method three. Um Method three is a little different in that. Um, since you are going straight down the line in order, unlike method two, where you'll arrange it to taste, um, you're doing a six by six grid and then taking the best characteristics from those. And method four is basically you roll up stats for 12 characters and pick of those 12, which one you want to play. So there are many methods you can allow your players to use. I recommend for simplicity's sake, one. If you're going to use the other methods, roll the dice beforehand and let the players pick. You, the DM, roll the dice beforehand and then hand the matrix written out on a piece of paper, in an email, whatever, and say, okay, pick in two, three, or four. So here's a little bit of, in, bit of info about non-player characters. Non-player characters, I feel like, um, one, we've gone over a lot in henchmen and hirelings, but I want to come back to NPCs as part of the DMing art. Um, Gary mentions the effect of wishes on character ability scores. Wishes are alter reality spells um, to increase them. Now, interestingly, he notes 
It strongly suggested that you place no restrictions upon such use of wishes. However, at some point it must be made more difficult to go up in ability, or else many characters will eventually be running around with several 18s or even higher. Therefore, when an ability score reaches 16, it should then be ruled a wish will have the effect of increasing the ability by only one-tenth of a point. Thus, by means of wishes, or wishes and or alter reality spells, a charisma score of 16 can only be raised to 17 by use of 10 such wishes. The score going from 16 to 16.1 with a first, 16.2 with a second, and so on. This is not to say that magical books or devices cannot raise scores of 16 or better to a full point. The prohibition is only on wishes. And I would suggest you be very careful about that at any rate. Because, you know, if I, if I had a ring, if I, if I had a ring and I could wish for a stat increase in real life, just one, and I said, well, I want my intelligence to go up by one point. Well, one IQ point regarding one point of information, what? Don't let your players metagame too much when it comes to wishes. I want X, and they're referring to things outside the game. Make them abstract it end it back into the game. I wish my character were twice as strong as he currently is, is a valid way to wish. I wish my character had a strength 17, is not. That's just my house, right? I should have had my house rolling hat on for that. Um, so yeah, we have characteristics for NPCs. Now, something that comes up, something that comes up a lot is, why doesn't AD&D have a skill system? Well, it does. And I'm not talking about thieves and like abilities. Now, that's a valid in-game wish, wishing for a pair of gauntlets of ogre power. Now, I might say that, okay, you receive a flash of inspiration, that there's a gauntlet of ogre power in a heap of treasure that is currently guarded by, uh, you know, some terrible monster in a dungeon that's not too far away. All you have to do is go get them. It, but it would depend on how it's worded. Um... But yes, AD&D 1st Edition does have skills, and I want to talk about those today. Later editions of D&D became very skill-heavy, and they led to a bad practice of gaming. And this is, a, you know, I'm going to get a little edition worry. Um... The uh, um, s mindset, sorry, the mindset became anything that's not on my character sheet, I can't do. And that's wrong. That, that prohibition is completely backwards. It's not that you can't do anything because it's not on your character sheet. It's that you can do anything because you're not restricted by not having a certain skill. So let's look at non-professional skills. These are not the same thing as NWPs, not by a, a long stretch. And we'll talk about DMing player character non-professional skills. When a player character selects a class, and this is, uh, we are on page... 12 of the PDF. I think they renumbered these pages for the PDF, so we may be on page 15 if you have the physical book. You know, I have the physical book right here. Let me give you guys a little bit of uh, a little bit of hep with that. This is... Oh, no, it's page 12 in the book. They kept the numbering. 
This is page 12 in the, the physical copy. Anyway, when a player character selects a class, this profession is assumed to be that which the character has been following previously virtually to the exclusion of all other activities. Thus, the particular individual is at first level of ability. However, some minor knowledge of certain mundane skills might belong to the player character. Information and training from early years or incidentally picked up while the player or while the individual was in apprenticeship learning his or her primary professional skills of clericism, fighting, etc. If your particular campaign is aimed at a level of play where secondary skills can be taken into account, and note that you don't have to do this. But if you want to, here's a little something you can do. Then use the table below to assign them to player characters or even to henchmen if you so desire. Assign a skill randomly or select according to the background of your campaign. To determine if a sk second skill is known, roll on the table and if the dice indicate a result of two skills, then assign a second appropriate one. Now, we're going to look at the list in a second, but I want to come down to this because this is where we start getting into the art of dungeon mastering. When secondary skills are used, it is up to the DM to create and or adjudicate situation in which these skills are useful to the player character. As a general rule, having a skill will give the character the ability to determine the worth and soundness of an item, the ability to find food, make small repairs, or actually construct crude items. <clears throat> For example, an individual with armor skill could tell the quality of normal armor, repair chain links, or perhaps fashion certain weapons. To determine the extent of knowledge in question, simply assume the role of one of these skills one that you know a little something about, and determine what could be done with this knowledge. Use this as a skill to weigh the relative ability of characters with secondary skills. And there is social class and rank, as Gary notes. I have seen characters, players rather, use these so cleverly and fall back on them to determine whether or not they can do a certain thing on an adventure and they've helped out. I have had players who played years and never like, oh, my secondary skill is minor. Okay. And then they just go on about their business. They never question it. But someone with minor might say, hey, does it look like the ceiling's going to fall? Now, you'll note that there's no system associated with these beyond determining what they are. That's up to you. Now we start getting into the art. Now put your brush to the page and start making the first strokes. Here is where you as a dungeon master will need to decide where these fall in terms of do I want to roll a die? Do I want to say it just applies and they know and what have you? So on the chart, um, and it's, it, there's not a hundred of them. So, uh, you know, if, if you're not reading along, rest assured, I'm not about to rattle off a salad bar of a hundred of these, but it's percental dice. You have armorer, bowyer, or fletcher, which is someone who can make and repair bows and arrows a farmer or gardener, a net fisherman, a forester, gambler, hunter or fisher, uh, and if you're a fisher in this case, it means hook and line, husbandman, which is animal, animal husbandry, you know, you don't have to take care of cows, sheep, pigs, that sort of thing, jeweler or lapidary, that very useful and say, hey, you know, we got these two giant rubies or are they giant rubies or are they just colored glass? Leather worker or tanner, limner or painter, mason or carpenter, miner, navigator, fresh or salt water, sailor, fresh or salt water, shipwright, boats or ships, tailor or weaver, teamster, freighter, 
trader, barterer, trapper, furrier, woodworker, cabinet maker, and then 68 to 85, no skill of measurable worth. And what that means in this context is that basically nothing you did impacted your life that greatly. And then uh, 86 to double nuts, roll twice, ignoring this result hereafter. So you could have a leather worker tanner who was also a navigator on, um, on saltwater sailing vessels. In the, the DM's hands then here is a fun way to adjudicate situations. We go back to the gem example. You know, you don't want to just hand the party a grocery list of the gems and their values. Or let's say you don't. Now, my Monday night game, I have uh, an experienced thief and a couple of characters with the... Um, with the uh, lapidary skill. So, yeah, I, I do just... Um, I, I, I do give them a, an indication of what the things are worth. That doesn't mean that they'll sell them for that value. Just that they know, you know, that they might be getting screwed if they go to a market and sell a diamond that's worth 50,000 gold pieces and they're offered 300 for it. They're going to know that they're going to get screwed on a deal like that. But if you come to a point, you know, if a character says, okay, well, you know, our ship sank out from under us. We're on this raft or in this lifeboat in the middle of the sea. Um, you know, Bob has navigator, salt water. So we can at least figure out which direction we should go. But what do we do for food? Well, Bill has netting fishermen. All right, so you might say roll percentile dice. I'll give you a percentage chance to catch a fish that day. You might say roll a d6 and that's how many fish you catch that day. You might say, roll a d6, and on a 1, you catch a fish. And for netting, you know, the person with that skill, you know, as you don't have a net in the boat. Okay, well, can I make one? Sure. Or you might, you know, you might just say, hey, you don't have the materials. What about making it out of our clothes? No, that won't work. Or you might decide that it will work. But all of these are neat little flavorful things that player characters can potentially have. And you don't have to roll for them. You can hand these out to the characters or you can let the characters roll. I'll let the characters roll here, even though this is in the Dungeon Master's Guide. I'll just straight up say, yeah, okay. Um, you know, give me a percental dice roll. Oh, look at that. You're a mason carpenter. And what effect that might have on an adventure, I don't know. But when it comes time to adjudicate something on these skills, it's up to you as the DM to decide their applicability and how you wish to resolve their applicability. You may make an on-the-spot ruling you may have the characters roll a die. But, and I cannot emphasize this strongly enough, do be even-handed in it. If you have two characters with a skill, both have the skill minor, and one of them says, I want to look at the ceiling and determine to, to determine whether or not it's safe. We're in this, you know, cave. I, I don't want to get crushed by falling rocks. Uh, Yeah, you look at it and it's safe, you know, because you, the DM, know that it is. Um, and then later the other player with a minor skill says, I want to check the floor and see if it's safe. Unless you have a specific reason to don't say, okay, give me a percentile dice roll. Now give me a D6 roll. Now give me a D4 roll in your mind thinking, unless they roll OO and then a one and then another one, you're not going to tell them be even handed in whatever mechanic you apply 
at the moment. Sometimes you won't want to apply a mechanic. You know, you may just want to keep the game moving. You've got someone with gambling skill. They say, okay, we're in uh, Verbabank. I want to go out and gamble. I have the gambling skill. Roll 2d10 and tell them that's how many gold pieces they came home with. Now, there is a gambling section in the Dungeon Master's Guide, as we'll see uh, in the future. But if you don't want to use it, you know, you may roll a d6, 1 through 3. They did well. 4 through 6, they didn't do well. You roll a 5. Roll 2d10. Uh, you know, it's uh, 7. All right, you lost seven gold pieces. So those are secondary skills. And it's one, possibly two. A clever player and a clever DM can expand those things out to great, great utility. Or you can just never let it come up. If the players don't bring it up, you don't have to bring it up. Um... One of my players has leather worker Tanner. They were playing a white plume mountain and accidentally trod through a giant patch of green slime. Fortunately for them, there were no casualties. But they lost their boots. All their boots were destroyed. So they hobbled back to their camp and cut apart saddlebags and made boots. I just said, sure, you can do that and made soft boots out of saddlebags. And then back into the dungeon. So it's up to you how to apply, when to apply, these skills. And remember, this is not a skill system. AD&D is an avatar-based game. Not Avatar The Last Airbender. Although you can do that with AD&D, but I digress. Hello, Chris. Hey, Randy. See Randy Buckness over on Facebook. Good to see you, my friend. It's been a while since I've seen you out there in the audience. Randy Buckness, everybody. Damien talking about wishes says, I wish to have the might to rival a frost giant. I could have a lot of fun with that as a DM if I thought it was being too greedy. All right. You have 500 men under arms at your command. They need to be fed, paid, equipped, and housed. Good luck. We'll talk about wishes uh, at, at a later time. So, so that's your first introduction to the art of DMing. Not, not the rules, the art of DMing. If you guys have any thoughts or considerations on that, please put your questions in the chats so, and I will see them and I will answer them. Looks in coin purse moth flies out. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. Um, so starting level, this this merits mentioning. Um, Gary says, as a general rule, the greatest thrill for any neophyte player will be the first adventure when he or she doesn't have any real idea what is happening. Isn't that true? Isn't that true from a DMing standpoint or from a playing standpoint? The first time you played... The first time you stepped in the river, the first time you went out into the surf, you know, you get a, you get a rush out of it. Um, of course, that assumes that the character lives, Gary points out.
Now, one thing that, that Gary brings up here, and I want to, this is again where, where we depart a little bit. And he says, if you have an existing campaign with the majority of the players being already above first level, it might be better to allow the few newcomers to begin at second level or even third or fourth in order to give them a survival chance when the group sets off for some lower dungeon level. I do not personally favor granting unearned experience levels, except in extreme circumstances such as just mentioned, for it tends to rob the new player of the real enjoyment he or she would normally feel upon actually gaining levels. Now, that's the new player. Experienced players, and there, there is mention of this later, Experienced players coming into your game, bringing a new character in to an already extant campaign is a completely different order. Those players, you generally start at an average of everybody's levels. So if, you know, you've got two fourth level characters and two eighth level characters, um, which would be quite the disparity, but it could potentially happen. And then a fifth player conversant with eight first edition AD and D wishes to join, um, you know, you might say, okay, four eight, twenty-four, so so you'd bring them in at sixth level. But that's experienced players. And this goes into Gary's great style in this book. This is why the Dungeon Master's Guide is such a great read. And this is, this is where we kind of get into Gygaxian. Not High Gygaxian, as we'll see later, but Gygaxian. It has been called to my attention that new players will sometimes become bored and discouraged with the struggle to advance in levels of experience, for they do not have any actual comprehensions of what it is like to be a powerful character of high level. In a well-planned and well-judged campaign, this is not too likely to happen, for the superior DM will have just enough treasure to whet the appetite of the players while keeping them lean and hungry still, and always after that carrot just ahead. And one player's growing all we can often be dissipated by rivalry, i.e. he or she fails to go on an adventure, and those who did play not only had an exciting time, but brought back a rich haul as well. Thus, in my opinion, a challenging campaign and careful refereeing should obviate the need for immediate bestowal of levels of experience to maintain interest in the game. However, whatever the circumstances, if some problem such as this exists, it has been further suggested that allowing relatively new players to participate in a modular campaign game, assuring new players of uh, new players of characters of higher level, would often whet their appetites for continued play at lower level. So what Gary is telling us here is to hook players in, run a short game, maybe something out of a tournament module, and let them play a high-level character right off the bat. Just right from the get-go, they get to play a high-level character. And when they do... That'll whet their appetite. They'll say, okay, now I want to climb the ladder. Now I want to build a character up to this point. Now there may be some disappointment that they've gone from, you know, Sir Robert the Bold, who can commit to two attacks every melee round and and had a magic sword plus four and a shield plus two and a potion of healing handy down to... Uh, you know, Bob the Expendable with seven hit points, chainmail, and a uh, a dagger and a spear and a wooden rondash. And the only thing in a flask on his belt is is uh, is some some watered down wine. But if you tell them what they can become, and you show them exemplary through a module, it can often motivate your players. So character, age, disease, and death. Now, once the DM has created characters, and people were asking about character ages when we were talking about creating characters in the player's handbook, and we're going to talk about that right now. We're going to address that right now. Um, 
character ages do impact. Your your players um, or your 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 player characters' abilities. They do impact them. I myself, and I should have had the house rule hat on. I myself will start players with the idea that whatever age they are. The bonuses and penalties based on those ages to character stats are already accounted for in the generation. That is, I if someone rolls an 18 and their age would bring that down to a 16 or a 17, rather, I math good. I don't deduct it. I just assume that, you know, they've held on to their youth and grace and beauty or it more practically it would bring a 12 down to an 11 i assume that it was a 13 brought down to a 12 but you don't have to do that here so we can get a look at the relative ages of starting characters and their classes so if you're a dwarf and it mentions clerics here, but that is for non-player characters. But if you're, you know, a dwarf fighter thief, well, that's 40 years plus 5d4 years, or 75 years plus 3d6 years, which should you use? You can average them together. You can add them together. Remember, dwarves are longer lived than, than men. So whatever you do, it's not going to severely impact it. And then it goes on down the line. Elves, 500 plus 10d10 years if they're a non-player character cleric. Fighter, merely 130 plus 5d6 years. Magic user, 150 plus 5d6. Or thief, 100 plus 5d6. And it just goes on down the line. And you begin to get an idea of how long these characters live. <laughs> Half orcs, not long at all. Humans, on the other hand, you could be a 16-year-old fighter in the game. Look at that. 15 plus 1d4 years is your starting age as a fighter. You could literally have a player who's 16 years old. Now, as to why you would determine your character's age, there are certain spells that when enacted upon a character can age them. There are certain monster attacks that will age characters. A ghost can age a character from 10 to 60 years. For an elf, this is not a problem. For a human illusionist who's already 36 years old, this could be a huge problem, as we'll see here in a moment. Once character age is established, you must keep track of it from game year to game year. And we'll talk about time in the campaign later. To normal game time, years must be added any of the various unnatural causes, i.e. aging. And then we have aging here. So you see... Um, now this is interesting. Look at this. By this point, the D-series was already out. I think. I'd have to look. I'd ha it, mm. Now that I've said that, I'm not sure. But Gary's got a little bit of background on Drow Elves right here already in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Interesting, yes? But Grey Elves live up to 2,000 years, possibly beyond. No, it doesn't say venerable equals dead. But you can look at the age brackets and get an idea. 
that a young adult gray elf is 250 years old at maximum. Before they're even beyond what could be considered their teenage years, a gray elf may have seen three or four humans he considers nearly best friends grow old and die. Think about that. Oh, lost a studio light. Didn't even notice. Now, here are the bonuses and, and malices. As, as Kyle calls them. If you're a young adult, subtract a point of wisdom and add a point of constitution. If you're mature, add a point of strength and add a point of wisdom. Middle-aged, subtract one point or half exceptional rating of strength and one point of constitution. Add one point of intelligence and one point of wisdom. Old, subtract two points of strength two points of dexterity, and one point of constitution, add one point of wisdom. Older but wiser indeed. And venerable. Subtract one point of strength, one point of dexterity, and one point of constitution, add a point of intelligence, and a point of wisdom. And the adjustments can't re exceed racial maximum, nor can they be used if they cause abilities to exceed stated maximums. So you're not going to wind up with a venerable human with an intel with a wisdom of 21, a, you know, godlike levels of intelligence. It is important to remember that adjustments cannot exceed. Yeah, okay. And uh, adjustments cannot lower an ability beyond racial or class minimums. That is very important. You cannot fall out of being a paladin because you're young. It won't take your wisdom below what it should be to be a paladin or a ranger. Again, that's part of the whole... I myself, house ruling, assume that those numbers are, are baked in. Now, unnatural aging, look at this. Alter reality, gate, limited wish, restoration, resurrection, wish, imbibing a speed potion, or under a haste spell will age your character. Think about that. Well, my magic user is high enough level. He's in his 70s. He's going to cast Wish. Really, what's he going to wish for? <laughs> is it to be three years younger? Because I got some news for you. And yes, Chris, those adjustments are cumulative. Your wisdom grows the longer your character lives. And then we get into disease and so on, which is more, more DMing, you know, purely DMing. But I wanted, I, I just, I wanted to address some of the things regarding early character creation. And there is more. There is more um, about early character creation. And in fact, uh, oh, it's not, it hasn't been nearly as long as I thought. So we're going to look at that. So you guys have kind of gotten the idea now, I hope, when you've created or your players have created their characters, you still have work to do. You can still come in here and adjust their character and help them adjust their character. So Bob the fighter with tens all the way down the line, he might be mature. So suddenly Bob's strength becomes 11 and his wisdom becomes 11. So it differentiates him from how he'll be when he's the retired fighter, Sir Robert the Bold, and he's venerable. He's pushing 91 years old. When he will have gotten... A 
Another point of intelligence, another point of wisdom, now his wisdom would be 12. But his constitution, strength, and dexterity will have dropped. His wisdom becomes a 13, and then when he hits venerable, his strength, dexterity, and constitution are even lower. But his wisdom is now 14, and his intelligence is 12. So you see how as a DM, you take the simple characters that they create and you give them a little bit more color, a little bit more vibrancy, a little bit more life. You breathe life into the characters for the players. And again, there's unnatural aging, but let's talk about the magic user specifically. Um, oh, well, you know what? Let's look at one other thing, and that's a death due to age. Um, it is entirely possible that your favorite character could live long enough to die of old age. Um, and assuming that that character lives long enough to retire, uh, the maximum age table, you can either dice on it right when the character is being created, or you can wait until the point at which they say they retire and the player would like to know what eventually happens to them. I would recommend maybe doing it, noting it somewhere in your own copy of the character sheets, and then setting it aside. But your character, but your, your player's characters may live, you know, only to the lowest of old age. They may only live to 60. Or they may live all the way to the highest possible age of venerable, which, you know, that's uh, plus an additional 20 years. So you could have a, a human character who doesn't pass away till they reach 140 years old. But note that there's minuses too. So old lowest age plus D8. So if we look at old age, God, I don't want to, for a human is 61 years. But it's not merely you reach 61 and then you got to go to carousel. A little Logan's run joke there. Um, 61 plus 1 to 8 years. But then on venerable, it'll be 120 plus D20. So again, you could have a venerable human character who lives to 140 degrees. 140 degrees. 140 years! Sorry, it's a little hot out here. My my mind's on the temperature in my studio. Um, yeah, that's a mistake Carson never made when he was alive. Anyway, um... So there's some maximum age determination methods here. Uh, the dice rolled indicate that a dwarf character will live to old age, lowest figure, plus D8. As a span is considered 100 years, D8 stands for decades. So the character will live for 251 years, plus 10 to 80 years. So consider that. Now, one thing that uh, Gary does go into here is a little bit more outlining of character abilities. And this is the science part of DMing. This is a little bit more that leans on what we've already learned in the player's handbook. Um, strength and exceptional strength and intelligence wisdom 
but it helps you, the DM, understand these these things a little bit better. And I would this is information I would impart to the players also. Um, but the nice thing about this is you get an idea of what the strength of given monsters is also. In this case, referring to humanoid uh, creatures that may want to eat you. Um, for example, kobolds have a strength of 9, goblins 10, orcs 12, hobgoblins 15, gnolls 16, bugbears 17, ogres 18, and trolls a strength rating of 18 plus. Gnomes have an average strength rating of 10, dwarfs 14, elves 12, halflings 8, and giants 19 and up. Now, how does this pertain in terms of additional damage and so on? That's really up to you, the DM, as to whether or not you want to add the extra damage. If you look at the damage that monsters are capable of doing, and we'll take a look a little bit at the monster manual. It's really part of the art of DMing is running monsters. You'll see that, generally speaking, your evil humanoid monsters are already doing enough damage that you don't really, as a DM, need to worry about adding two hit and two damage bonuses. Again, I tend to think that that is already baked in. Uh, notes about exceptional strength. Uh, fortunately, monsters, outside of giants and trolls, or giants and ogres, rather, don't get that. Um... Intelligence, the intelligence rating roughly corresponds to our modern IQ scores. However, it assumes the mnemonic reasoning and learning ability and skills and areas, uh, additional areas outside the written word. Wisdom, for game purposes, wisdom ability subsumes the categories of willpower, judgment, while enlightenment and intuitiveness. An example of the use of wisdom can be given that while noting while the intelligent character will know that smoking is harmful to him, here he may well lack the wisdom to stop. This writer may well fall into that category. Yeah, Gary, you did. You did fall into that category. Dexterity, of course, we know is hand-eye coordination. Don't really need a, uh, too much more explanation of that. Constitution and charisma. But a note about charisma, and we've talked about this before. Many persons have the sad misconception that, that charisma is merely physical attractiveness. This error is obvious to any person who considers the subject with perceptiveness. Charisma is a combination of physical appearance, persuasiveness, and personal magnetism. True charisma becomes evident when one considers such historic examples of Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Adolf Hitler. Obviously, these individuals did not have an 18 score in physical beauty, so it is quite possible to assume the scores over 18 are possible for any one of the named historical personalities would have had a higher charisma score. There can be no question that these individuals were 18s if they would have had great physical attractiveness as well as commanding personal magnetism and superb persuasiveness. Again, charisma is not just how good looking a player is. It's not. I can think of a hundred women in Hollywood right now who are physically good looking and I find them to be absolutely repugnant. So there you go. But then what do I know? I'm just a guy that plays Dungeons and Dragons. So I want to come back to A little bit about um, or go back a little bit more and look at magic users but we're kind of running up on time so I just want to talk about player racial tendencies not necessarily exactly to just read the dungeon master's guide at you guys but these Stereotypes, for lack of a better term. Um, yes, Ricky, as opposed to phys as opposed to mentally, um, these stereotypes have carried through in fantasy from the beginning. 
when people started writing fairy stories. Um, dwarves are dour and taciturn, you know, uh, they're given a hard work and care little for most humor. Elves are considered flighty and frivolous, and this is the case when they do not believe a matter is of import. They concern themselves with the natural beauty around them, dancing and frolicking, playing and singing, unless necessity dictates otherwise. Because they love nature, they're not fonds of ships or mines, but growing things in the lands under the sky. They don't make friends easily, but friend or enemy is never forgotten. Now, when you're going to live probably for 2,000 years, making friends with somebody can be kind of tough, particularly if they're not elves. Because, you know, in what you might consider just to be a few seasons, that person's not going to live all that long. You know, it's going to be like making best friends with a border collie. What do you got, mate? 12, 14 years on the outside? Gnomes, I think Gary's probably drawing from the uh, the, the book of gnomes there. Half-elves probably fall, uh, you know, much like their elven parenting characteristics, although somewhat lesser to a somewhat lesser extent than a pure elf. Half orcs are boars. They are rude, crass, crude, and generally obnoxious. Because most are cowardly, they tend to be bullies and cruel to the weak, but they will quickly knuckle under to the stronger. This does not mean that all half orcs are horrid, only most of them. <laughs> but remember, you're the final arbiter. If that's not how you want half orcs to be in your campaign, then don't do it. Gary is simply giving you an outline, a template to follow some direction if you're just like, I don't, how would a half-orc act? Oh. Again, the art of DMing. And after that, we get into followers for upper-level player characters, which is a whole big section that will take its own time and space to explain and to understand. So I don't really want to, you know, it, it would be a, an additional hour. And I did want to look at um, magic users and how you get those suckers, the, their, their, their spells. Um, the magic user player, and I think we're over on page 32 for that. Let's see. Nope. The before then. No, but that's some really cool stuff there. Alignment, alignment. Lycanthropy. Poisons. Let me see here. Let me just zip down. Sorry if I uh, make you guys dizzy here. Let's see. Spells. Ah, 38. Let's see. Let's head over to page 38. When you're DMing, the temptation may be high... To give your magic using player, <clears throat> you know, just say, oh, yeah, well, you know, here, you've got a spell book. You don't want to start the game off with magic users outshining the martial classes. <clears throat> On page 39 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. You start out as an apprentice, and when your teacher says, congratulations, uh, here's your certificate of graduation from the upstairs Acme uh, Knight College for Magic Users, um, they're really only leaving with a few spells in hand. It is incumbent on you as the dungeon master to not let the player go with just a sheaf of spells and maybe a couple of charged wands and so on. 
magic users start with a limited number of spells. If you're feeling particularly generous, you might pick the spells for them. I don't recommend it. Let the dice tell a story here. Another piece of DMing art. Let the dice tell a story that neither you nor the players expected. But anyway, page 39 for magic users. The magic using player will start off with read magic. He has to know how to read magic. That is a given. But you'll roll a d10 for offensive spell, de defensive spell, and miscellaneous spells. Or if you hit a 10, you or the player might choose. So just to give you an example of this, briefly, we'll just grab a d10 here. and say that Robert, the magic user, starting out at first level, in his spell book, he has read magic. But what offensive spell does he have? Sleep is obviously one that is highly desirable. That is, as I like to call it, the first level magic user's fireball spell. Well, look at that, we got a one. His offensive spell is burning hands. He can inflict two points of damage with a Burning Hand spell. Robert is going to need some Hirelings and a powerful group. Defensive spells has a three, Featherfall. Well, at least Robert is not going to be killed by the first 10-foot pit the party steps on. And finally, he gets a Miscellaneous spell. Now, the Miscellaneous spell, this is important. He might not start out with right. That's correct. Robert might not start out with the spell right. Oops. Got some wrinkles on the tablecloth today, so that cocked a little bit. Well, I rolled a 10. So Robert chooses, and he wisely chooses right. But let's say he didn't. Let's say he said, ooh, Find familiar. I want to find a familiar. I want to see if I can get an animal companion to help me out of the dungeon. That's your thing, man. But what does he do about future spells? He'll have to bargain and barter for the spell right to be gifted to him in the future so he can continue to put stuff in his book of magic. So he can continue to scribe spells into his spell book if he doesn't get it from the get-go. But that's it. At first level, that's it. And that may not sound like a lot. Read magic, burning hands, feather fall, and write. So what? It flavors the game because now the magic user is lean and he's thirsty to get his hands on spells by any means necessary. The party may say, we found a scroll with four magic user spells on it. We can sell this and buy Bob plate mail and marry a war horse and, and stay in the best inn in town. And then Robert is over there like, hey, hold up a second. Give me that scroll. I want to scribe those spells in my spell book. And there may be some negotiation at that point. Yes, Chris, write is the only way to scribe spells. If you want to transcribe a spell into your spell book, write is the only way to do it or to get a friendly magic user to give you right into your spell book. No, they have to use right. If you look under the, the, uh, the spell right in the player's handbook, it explains exactly how it's done when you're transcribing spells and so on. It's a dangerous, dangerous possibility. If Robert only has two hit points at first level, 
and he's transcribing a spell and he blows his saving throw versus magic, it could kill him. Magic is a dangerous thing for the low-level magic user, especially if the low-level magic user is trying to transcribe a higher-level spell into a spell book. But you see now, there on page 39, again, and I'm going to say this a lot, You're, you guys are going to get sick of hearing me say the art of DMing, but despite the fact this is mechanics, it does lean heavily on the art, because now you've got a magic user, he can put spells in his books, he can read scrolls. But as far as defending himself, all he's got is feather fall and burning hands. Now, he's going to be bucking to get his hands on more scrolls or the spell books of evil magic users that the party has slain. That definitely changes magic users substantially. Always ignored right before this. Well, you shouldn't. See, that's what I was talking about, Chris, and I'm not picking on you. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. Before you change things in the rules, look at how they work. Because it's going to significant, it may significantly change the way you approach the game in a good way, in a positive way. So I hope that's been informative, guys. And I, I, I hope you take the matter of your character's age and the magic user and his spell use, I hope you take that to heart. Because we're going to see those things coming up more and more as we, as we go on, as, as we learn more about the art of DMing. The stuff we talked about today will become more and more relevant as it goes on. Um, I don't, you know, I fully intended to talk about just going into combat today. Because I was like, let's get into nuts and bolts. Let's maybe ignore the art so much. But then I said, no. There's things to learn about character creation from a DMing standpoint. And things that, as Chris says, will impact players. And I'm glad we did. I'm glad we looked at that. So I don't want to say... Next time, we're going to talk about this right here, you know. But we'll look at a couple of other options for players and non-player characters before we get into combat. Because combat leads into the adventure, and the adventure leads in to managing experience points and awarding of experience points. So these core lessons we're doing now about learning the nuts and bolts of combat and adventuring and experience points and so on, even though there's things that come before and after them, all of those things branch off of and, and flavor and build onto those things, which is not to say they're the only and most important things in the book. They aren't. We're going to talk about world building. We're going to talk about character social status. We're going to talk about proper placement of treasure, about furnishing your dungeons, and tons of little flavorful things and how you can approach those things. You know, what do the characters do when they're in a city? All that's coming. So I hope you found today's uh, live stream informative. Um, again, it's important that that we look at and we understand the um, the 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 nature of certain aspects like aging, like starting out as a magic user, and so on before we move forward. So. Are there any questions? Any questions at all? Anything imparting? If anyone has any questions, comments, criticisms, negative, nasty remarks, I'll be more than happy to answer them. More than happy. Tomorrow is uh, tomorrow's Friday. Woohoo! Friday, Friday. 
Oh, you're quite welcome for the stream, Kim. Wouldn't miss it for the world. All right. Well, remember, if you do have any questions that came up today or you think of them after the fact, there is a Discord for the channel. Didn't you know? Everybody's using it. Everybody's talking about it. It's the most popular first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Discord channel that I run. None of my other first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Discord channels are as popular as that one. But if you want to go over and you want to subscribe, you want to join us for memes and chats and, and ask me questions and BS and hang out, you feel free to. Because if there's something that comes up in a stream and you don't know what the hell I was talking about and I missed your question or your question didn't like you're lying in bed tonight going wait a minute why wouldn't I take fine familiar over right hold on then you can ask in the discord so you guys have a wonderful afternoon have a great uh, Thursday I will see you all tomorrow we'll be back for more lessons uh, peace to you all Stay safe, stay cool. Oh, and I want to, uh, before we go, I was, tell your friends to like and subscribe. Click that bell icon for notifications. Give me a thumbs up if you, if you want to. Um, YouTube's being a brat and not showing me my channel right now. Um, I don't know what's going on with that. Yeah, YouTube's been acting up today. So I think I've got 750 subscri or 755 subscribers now, which is cool. We're we're ever moving on towards a thousand subs, at which we will have the mini con, which I've talked about many times. Games galore being run by yours truly for you guys, in a virtual sense. I don't think you all want to come down here to my house. I don't have enough room anyway. But that's what we'll do when we hit a thousand subs. Have a great afternoon, guys. I'll talk to you later. Peace.